Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Jonah chapter 1, in the first verse. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go, to, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind unto the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be, was like to be broken. And the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship, in, that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah had was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if it be so that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us, so they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? And what is, it, and what is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the man knew he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. I'll be preaching this morning, the Lord being my helper on the thought, the solution, and the storm. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, we thank you how it strengthened us down through the years, and has it, how it's helped us and sustained us. We pray once again, Lord, that you would sustain your people with your word, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, some very familiar verses of Scripture, and I've said this to many times to my people, uh, Jonah is not a child's story. Uh, there's great truth in the, in the word Jonah wrote down concerning the power and the preservation of the Lord. Now, how an individual can read a, a, a word like Jonah and in Daniel when God's men were thrown into the fiery furnace and came out without even smelling like smoke and deny God's ability to, to sustain the soul is beyond my comprehension, but people deny it every day. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you, not only was Jonah a saved man, Jonah was a preacher. He, uh, he uh, loved the Lord, and apparently it was no new thing for him to preach the Word of God, and, uh, but he was fearful of the command of God. Have you ever been fearful of the command of God? That he told you to do something that, that caused you to sweat a little bit, caused you to worry a little bit, caused you to be concerned? Now, if you have not, just wait or make your calling and election sure. Because he, he's going to push you out of your comfort zone. He's going to put you in situations that make you think. And that's the God that we serve. And, and many people today teach this if you want to or if you, if you wish to and all this foolishness when the God of the Bible is sovereign and he puts you in those situations for purpose and those purposes are always to his glory. 
Now, when you get in the worst situation you possibly can think of this morning, just remember this, there's a solution. And that solution is Christ. How that will come to pass, I don't know, but I do know what the solution is. And, and, and this is the problem of God not being sovereign. If, if you believe that, and sometimes Satan could win. Is that not true? I mean, if you believe that God is, uh, uh, that he's hoping you might do something, there's a chance for the uh, very son, the very son of Satan to come up on top. Is that not right? I mean, you can't believe one without the other, right? God can't be sovereign and not sovereign. He has to be right. So what put Jonah into this situation and how did our Lord God use it as he always does? Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. Now, uh, that in itself put alarm into Jonah's heart, and that baby like me go and say, you go to San Francisco and preach on a street corner uh, uh, what the sodomites are really about. Uh, same thing, uh, you know what? You probably would never see me again, right? Uh, they probably stoned me down there. They probably, and, and that's the kind of message Jonah was getting. Listen, this was not a city that loved God. This was not a city that had any interest in the God of the Bible. He went there full knowing, or he knew what the, he knew what the result was going to be, or, or he thought he did. Right? And he didn't want to go. How many times in your life you didn't want to use God's plan for your life? And uh, I'd say a lot of times we come down to that because we want things our way. We want, things, we want our life to go in a smooth way and mostly the way that we want it. And that was not what Jonah was getting. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now you know what? We live, we live, in, a city, we live in a day and age today where sin is not cried out against anymore. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you can think of a thousand different things in the new age. You know what? Uh, uh, my boys were boys, and my grandson is a boy, and, and there's no question that, and that's how God made them. But in the day which we live today, that's a questionable thing. That's the kind of city that Nineveh was, where the God-haters were on top, and God's people were down here. In fact, I'm not even certain there was a person of God there until Jonah got there. And, and so we see that the fears that Jonah had were genuine. And, and every one of us would struggle with an assignment that seemed uh, that it would have a certain outcome, and that specific outcome would be de the death to God's man. And uh, that makes us fearful. Verse 3, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, let, let me assure you this. You'll never flee from the presence of God. Now, you may get to the point of sin in your life where he'll withdraw himself from you. But if he has a purpose in you, he is going to be there, and he is going to never let you forget that. And he can whip you up one side and down the other. You know, the Lord God is merciful and kind, and, and, and he, he'll just tell us the first time, but the next time you may be getting a, a peach limb across your legs. You see what I'm saying? That, that's the part of God no one wants to hear about today, isn't it? Uh, the one where he punishes us, the one where uh, that, that he accomplishes things after his own will, is what Romans says, right? 
And, and, and so we see then that Jonah had forgotten that God was sovereign. You ever get in a bad situation and you almost forget God is sovereign? When you're not sure what the next best thing is to do? Now, uh, I, I praise God for it, but you know, uh, I've never, I've never had to look at a casket and one of my own children be in it. But you know, I think that would make you question a little bit, don't you? I remember I pastored at South Road, and man, they was ready to get rid of me after a year. But there was a little boy there, and he needed some extra help, and he and I became good friends, and it's just because I treated him like a person. And uh, I guess it's about a year and a half after we left there, he drowned. And um, they called me back and asked if I'd preach the boy's funeral. And of course I did. And at that time, you know what? I really did. I'd never even heard of God being fully sovereign. <laughs> I'll be honest. That, that was something outside my scope at that time. And it was very difficult to tell those parents, to comfort those parents. Now I think I could have do, done a better job because I, I, I could at least say this. I don't know why, but somehow God's in this. Yeah. So whatever, whatever uh, perils there, there, there may be, you know, God is in it, and Jonah learned it. Uh, what you don't want to do is get to the same point that Jonah did. Uh, being receptive to God's will is everything. Verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. Now, both the instances that we'll look at this morning is the wind doing what the wind does. Now, in when the Lord Jesus uh, witnessed to, Dick, to Nicodemus, what did he say? The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou canst not tell whence it come, or whether or whitherest it goeth, so is every man that is born of the Spirit. So, uh, when you think about the wind, who controls it? The Almighty, right? That's the only thing that you can come up with. The only maker of the wind and the guider of the wind is the Lord God Almighty. Now, we live in Tornado Alley here, and it can get a little scary at times, but you know what? Who's, who's God in all of those? The Almighty. Uh, why was Brother Junior and Sister Diane's house hit? I don't know. I really don't, but I do know this. God be praised in it. You know what? If nothing else, they both walked out of their life, right? And, and, and so we see the wind has always been an instrument that God spoke of himself. How did the Red Sea part? You all remember that? So there's a strong east wind. See, the wind is a useful thing of our God. We see it as un uh, uncontrollable, unmanageable, but our Lord God uses it to glorify himself. But the Lord sent a great wind. I will want you to notice this, that it wasn't rain, it wasn't thunder, it wasn't lightning, it was a wind. Just something that you can't see. All the thing you can know about the wind, how do you know it? It's because of the result of it, right? That's how you know it's there. You know how uh, the Lord God spoke to my heart? I just, I can't explain it to lost people. And really, you can't either. But I've seen the effects of redemption, haven't you? I've seen changed lives because of the Lord God had saved them. I saw the results of the wind. And we do too, every day. But the Lord sent, a strong, sent out a great wind unto the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be shaken. And the mariners were afraid and cried everyone unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship 
and to the sea to lighten it of them. Now, I want you to see, first of all, that there were men that called on their gods. And you see in your King James Bible, that's a little g. Not acknowledging the great God Jehovah, but what they worshipped and what they did. And I want you to see that we always need to be sure we're worshipping the God of the Bible, do we not? There's characteristics of the God of the Bible that many people don't like. Did you know that? Now, we all love the grace of God, don't we? But what do you think of his judgment? What, what do you think of his holiness? You know what? It's separate and apart of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We, are, we, have, we have no ability to approach God. And you know why? Because we're so sinful and ungodly. And we go at the feet of Jesus on the merit of Christ. And you know, have you ever wondered why people pray? And you should. This is right. In Jesus' name, amen. Because we don't even know what to pray for. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, when, when you pray for illness or something like that, you pray for uh, that bill could be paid. <laughs> Have you under, ever wondered what <laughs> Jesus takes to the throne? May not even have anything to do with that. Have you ever thought about that? And, and, and so we find that as Jonah <laughs> is in this situation, other people are calling the false gods, gods that don't have any ability, gods that can't make intervention, and you know what? Gods that didn't create the wind. You know who created the wind here? God did. The devil didn't create. Have you ever seen anywhere in the Bible, and in the book of Job, it says that he was given permission to do it, but the best I know of the Bible, the only place <laughs> that the devil ever, ever sent wind was in was in the in Job, and it blew, what it blew his how his son's house down and killed a bunch. It was in there, I think is how it says. And, and how did he do that? Under the permission of God, right? And, and, and so we see, you know, a lot of people uh, when when they hear gospel songs don't really. Look for the meaning. When, when the writer, uh, he says, I know the master of the wind. That's a great deal to be said, is it not? That, that, that's a wonderful truth to really say, you know what this is, uh, this is speaking of. Verse 6, so the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if it so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. Now, because we're, there's no mariners, no mariners in this assembly, we don't think about the danger of wind just by itself, do we? Because every time we see wind in good old Tennessee, especially tornadoes, what comes with it? Rain, most of the time hail, uh, a lot of stuff that comes with bad storms, right? But can you imagine the wind only being the problem? And that, that was what their issue was. And so the shipmaster certainly understood that and said, huh, we got to do something about the wind. But the wind was there to teach a lesson. Verse 7, and they, and they say, Everyone to his fellow come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil has come upon us. What, what is thy occupation, and whence comest thou? And what is thy country, and of what people art thou? Now, first of all, we see in verse 9, he answers these questions, and the answers that he gives them are not recorded for our benefit. But one question interests me, what is thy occupation? What do you do? 
And you know, as far as we know, and good for Jonah, I've never enjoyed that much. His only occupation, the Bible tells us, is that he was a preacher. Now, remember, concerning Paul, he said he was a preacher and a tent maker. I'm a preacher and a nurse. But apparently, Jonah had so been so blessed of God, he had full-time ministry. You know, that's almost unheard of in 2023, is it not? But Jonah had that blessing, and so the only thing I know that he probably told them was that he was a preacher and a missionary, and he was out of the will of God. You know, that is the most miserable place you can be with. And if you want to stop the stormy winds this morning, my best advice to you is get in the will of God. And so they have this discussion. And Jonah knows the only solution, don't he? And the only way we're going to stop this is for you to throw me in. And you know what? No one liked that plan. Have you ever noticed nobody ever likes God's plan? I, I've noticed that. And you know what? It, it would be pretty hard just to take a dude you don't know and sling him over in the sea and at his own bidding. <laughs> and so they tried to go against God's plan. <laughs> and the Bible says they rode harder. They push more and more against God's plan. And then finally, they threw him over. You know, uh, I've often wondered, and you that have studied the Bible more than me, y'all can let me in if you know it. I wonder why he didn't jump in. That, that's a strangety, isn't it? I mean, I've jumped off boats. It's, it's pretty easy, actually. But I think it was this, that he was under the judgment of God and you can't place, you can't carry out sentence on yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And so finally they throw him over and what does the Bible say? There was a great calm. Mm -hmm. You know what? When you get back in the will of God, there'll be a great calm. There'll be a peacefulness there like you don't understand him. The Bible actually says in the New Testament a peace that passeth all understanding. And sometimes it's a very, very hard, difficult thing to do what God wants you to do. To go, to go with God's plan over yours. And, you know, uh, I'll point out one more thing and we're going to go to the next, uh, to the next example and we'll be done. But in chapter 2, the first verse, and God had prepared a great fish. <laughs> Isn't it a wonderful thing that God always has things prepared for you? That wind accomplished its purpose, and now we have another uh, soulless uh, being that God uses to his own glory and his own honor. He's stowed out there, the fish gets him, and I'll tell you what, you talk about a sovereign God, he was still there in three days, wasn't he? The, the, the revival meeting started right on time, didn't it? See, that's the God we serve. And we should give him glory and honor. So we see the wind always accomplishes its, uh, its goal. The wind always is worked through the, through, the, through the Lord. The solution was throwing Jonah in which was above all, contrary to all mankind's thoughts, but it calmed the storm. It got the job done. It accomplished what it was supposed to. Now, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, very familiar verses of Scripture. And if you know your Bible, the Gospel of Matthew records two separate events. Uh, this happened twice, in other words. Now, sometimes I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and it takes more than one lesson. Uh, you know, certain things can be learned by raw or memory, and I think probably most things can, if we try. 
But I want you to see that sometimes it takes more than one stone. It takes more than one peach tree limb. It takes one more, more than one bloody nose. Sometimes we get into that situation, don't you? I do. And I, I don't think our, our parenting that comes from the Almighty is any different. I know it's always much better than parents we than the correction we get from our earthly parents. So this this is always good. So this is the second event of the same kind. And so Matthew 14, beginning in verse 16, Matthew 14 and beginning in verse 16, but God said unto them, Take heed, not depart, give ye them to eat. And this was the feeding of the five thousand men besides women and children. And they gave and, and they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded that the multitude sit down on the grass, and they and took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to the, his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude, and they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. Now, just as an aside, if you underline in your Bible, that 12 baskets full is very significant because that was one basket for each doubter. Every one of them didn't think, uh, Peter, you know, uh, Big Mouth Peter comes, what is, what is this little lunch among so many? Yeah. Well, he was doubting the ability of God, was he not? And, and uh, don't ever forget God can use the smallest thing. He, can, he blesses what he will, when he wants to, how he wants to, but it don't have to be a big dramatic thing for God to use it. So he, um, so he feeds the 5,000. Verse 21, and they, <coughs> excuse me, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children, and straightway Jesus constrained or required his disciples to get into his ship, and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went into the mountain court to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, he put them in the path of the wind. He said, I want you to go over there, knowing full well what was coming. You know, that makes me feel scared a little bit, don't it, you? That, you know, one day, Larry, my, uh, the Lord God might say, Larry, I need you to go to town. And when I get there, the old Dover Bridge is rumbling like an earthquake. You see what I'm saying? You say, well, that don't happen. Well, it happened here, <laughs> right? He, he did deliberately put him in the path of the storm. So the next time you're having a fight and the storm is whirling around you like you can't believe, remember God's in it. God's in it. He's never, he, uh, except the one time that we know, he's never given the wind reins to anybody else but himself. And so, don't blame it on the devil. Uh, you receive it as the blessing of God, and you be obedient. Don't let this. Uh, don't let these events change what you will do. But the ship was now, verse twenty-four. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now again, I will point out once again, it was just the wind, no rain that we know of, no thunder, no lightning. He was using the wind. Now, uh, when, again, when we think of storms, we think about you know heavy rains and lightning and thunder and all kinds of crazy stuff. But I want you to see he accomplished his will through the simple thing, or we think it's simple, but the magnificent thing of the wind. Uh, uh, just a breeze blowing by. 
course, here it had gotten pretty violent. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Have you ever seemingly been just running against the wind? That you could not make progress. I feel that somewhat sometime in the ministry. I've had some good times and bad times. I've seen this building almost full. Look at it now. Right? Now, first of all, when you think that way, you're, me you're measuring your success by the world's standard, not God's. And I also want you to see in that, you know what? Those were times of running against the wind, right? Remember uh, in the Gospel of Luke, occupy until I come. You know what occupation is? That's just keeping the post you're now at. The famous, it's Memorial Day is tomorrow. The famous sculpture when they were raising the uh, flag on the island of Iwo Jima. And uh, that that's coming up. And... Uh, you know, uh, they had to protect them. Iwo Jima is, is small. <laughs> it, that, that island, if I understand it correctly, is probably not even as big as Dover. <laughs> but you know, God had granted a victory, and they raised a flag. And not only that, they held their position. Iwo Jima was never lost again. And, and, and so sometimes the only thing we can do is hold our spot, continue against the wind, and you may not make one inch of progress, but maintain the line. That, that is what we are to do. That is our uh, solution to the storm. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's just before daylight, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now, I would, have, I would have loved to sing that. Defying all natural thoughts of man and walking on water. You know, I will give them credit for this. When he said, I'll see you on the other side. They didn't ask how, <laughs> did they? They just had confidence Jesus would be there. How often do you come to church with confidence that Jesus will be here? Yeah. Very important, I would say, don't you think? And so they're still not there. And here comes Christ walking on the sea. Uh, I, I don't... I, Sometimes I think I know a little bit about glory and what's to come. I don't know. But this is one event I would love to see. But you know, then all my carnality of my mind and saying, hey, that's impossible, will be gone. So it may not as mean, mean as much then as it does to me now. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out with fear. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things from there. His command. Be of good cheer. When your house burns down, be of good cheer. Uh, here a few weeks ago, uh, about the time I sold the 51 uh, to Brother Jody, we went from five cars down to two in literally a week. And uh, uh, having to take turns with them. And uh, you know what? I saw God in that. You know why? We made it work. <laughs> right? And... Uh, then I, when we could not do it anymore, Sarah had to get to school. I went down uh, to the place where you rent cars in Clarksville, and I said, I need a car. Uh, I need a car. 
And he said, which one do you want? I said, well, yeah, he's a salesman. No. See, that's the provision of God. He had a whole lot full of cars, and I had my pick. <laughs> right? And we got her a little car so she could travel to school. See, God provided a way. And uh, he, uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't stop the storm right away. Did you notice that? He said, it's I. In the very midst and the highest part of the winds, it's I. Be not afraid. What are you afraid of this morning? And I think we all have fears, do we not? I mean, I know I do. There's some things I wouldn't at all want to see. I wouldn't want to see my family hungry, right? Uh, I like having a job. <laughs> Sometimes I fuss about it, but you know what? I like having a job. And so he didn't take the problem away. He just said, be happy where you're at. Be of good cheer. Yeah, you're in the midst of the wind and you've been rolling all night long. But you be of good cheer. And you know, you know what they did have happy to be happy about? They were in the will of God. He said, you go, you row, and they were still rowing and not getting anywhere but they were in the will of God be of good cheer it is I be not afraid then Peter answered him and said Lord if it be thou bid me to come unto thee on the water the wind still blowing and he said come and when Peter was come down out of the ship he walked on the water to go to Jesus and when he saw the wind boisterous he was afraid now, this is, a, this is a perplexing thing to me. Did he see the wind? You ever saw wind? I haven't. Have you? I've seen the results of it, but I never saw wind. So what that tells me is Peter, and we know that from the rest of this, he was focused on the wrong thing. What was he focused on? He was focusing on the results. He was focusing on the results. And he was measuring fear and success by what he could see. Is that how you do? Do you, do you uh, measure the success of your ministry by results? Or do you blame it? Uh, or do you measure it that you're in the will of God? See, also I want to point out to you, they were rolling, 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 and that is work. And they were working to do what? Just to maintain their position. You know, when we work, 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 what do we want? To gain ground, do we not? Am I going to the nursing home in the morning just for my looks? Just because it's cool? No, I want that paycheck. Right? What if I was going just, just to be there? Not many people are going to do that, are they? And so they were working just to maintain their position. Jesus comes along and said, Peter, come on! And Peter got to focusing on something he could not even see. And he, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink, and he cried, saying, Lord, save me! And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said, O thou of little faith, wherefore did this thou doubt? Now, you know, you really get down on Peter on this, but it wasn't too long ago they were casting out demons. Remember that? That was an apostolic gift. We don't like to acknowledge it much as Baptists, but man, they could do it, right? And uh, there was one demon, remember? And he said, <laughs> he, he came to him and said, we can't get this demon out. Why can't we get it out? Because you have no faith. So you know what that tells me? Despite the whole situation, 
Peter had grown spiritually a little bit. He, he went from nothing to little. You know, that, that, that's moving in the right direction, is it not? And so we find that there's always a solution. The storm is always going to come. The storm is always going to be there. But there's a solution. So, the next, yes, you know, it always amazes me, uh, and it, it's dry as powder out there right now. I look like a, I don't know what, when I come in from mowing yesterday, just covered with dust. And, you know, it wasn't too long ago, I was fussed about how muddy it was. And yesterday I was praying for rain. And then cool breezes started blowing, it kind of get dark a little bit over there. Over in Kentucky, Dover, y'all must be living better than us because we didn't get a drop. You know what? I went from fussing about something to wanting it. Isn't that the fickle part of man? So whatever comes your way, just remember it's ordained of God. Remember God's good. He's precious. Man. And you know what? Every once in a while between the storms, what do you have? Peace. Yeah. Peace that passes all understanding. Growing grace.